Geocentricity Satellites and Mach's Principle by Malcolm Bowden If you send a small rocket into space, it will fall back to Earth. Send up a very powerful rocket and it will leave the Earth's gravitational field and travel out into space. If you send it up to be 22,236 miles above the Earth and going round the equator, it will travel round the Earth continuously at the same rotation as the Earth turns. It will then stay over the same place on the Earth's surface. These are known as geostationary satellites and are used for fixing the position of objects on the ground by calculating their distance from several satellites. The heliocentric explanation is that as the satellite orbits the Earth, the centrifugal force tending to fling it into space is precisely balanced by its gravitational attraction to the Earth. So it rotates in the same orbit and at the height of 22,236 miles above the Earth, it is going round the Earth at the same rate that the Earth is rotating. So it appears stationary over the equator. How does the geocentric model explain these stationary satellites? There is a factor that is virtually ignored by astronomers because it can be shown to support geocentrism. This factor is that, although they are far away, the huge mass of each star and their trillions of numbers have a major effect upon the Earth. This was first pointed out by Ernst Mach and is known as Mach's Principle. Indeed, scientists use the word Mach's Principle as a code for geocentrism. The satellite is attracted downwards by the Earth's gravity and upwards towards the rotating mass of the stars. Rotation has more energy and this adds to the attraction of the stars. At the height of 22,000 236 miles, these forces are equal, and the satellite stays at the same height. Wikipedia says, a very general statement of Mach's principle is, local physical laws are determined by the large scale structure of the universe. So we can say that it is not a hypothetical centrifugal force that operates on the satellites, but a real attraction to the stars. Several papers relevant to cosmology have been published by Thiring, Lenz and Thiring and Gerber, but the most important one is Gravity and Inertia in a Marchian Framework by J. B. Barber and B. Bertotti. Il Nuovo Cimento, 32b, brackets 1, pages 1 to 27, on the 11th of March, 1977. Although the maths are very advanced, the comments about the results given in the text are easy to understand, and I give a brief summary and quotations from its contents. All emphases are by MB. They examined mathematically the case of a solid stationary object, that is, the Earth, at the centre of a hollow sphere, the stars, rotating around it. They found that it produced the same effects upon the sphere as we experience on this Earth. The Coriolis forces on the air that produces cyclones and anticyclones in the north and south hemispheres, the equatorial bulge of the Earth's equator, the dragging of a free pendulum, all these are given as proof of the heliocentric model, but they are also generated by the rotating stars in the geocentric model. Mach's idea on motion were based on the conviction that physics is ultimately concerned with the relations between things and not between things and abstract space. We believe this is still a guiding principle. We believe that neither special nor general relativity fulfil Mach's ideal 
and we consider it important and suggestive to implement it in a pre-relativistic classic framework, i.e. it does not require relativity. We find it more enlightening to evaluate them using planetary dynamics. This will show how the behaviour of the solar system reflects the large-scale features of the universe. We obtain from Formula 7.1 Kepler's laws with two secular perturbations. A slow advance of the perihelion and a slow variation of the Kepler period due to the time dependence of alpha. The advance of the perihelion per revolution has the same dependence on the orbital elements as in general relativity. It can therefore explain the observed secular effects for all the planets. MB Using this model not only enables them to calculate the orbits of all the planets, but details such as the precession of their perihelions. This is quite amazing. I would mention that Einstein claimed as one of the proofs of relativity that it explained the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. However, Professor Poor pointed out that it only worked for Mercury and failed when applied to other planets. This paper provides a correct understanding of all the complex orbits of the planets. Thus, according to this model, the bulk of the matter in the universe is receding from us, or approaching us, as a velocity equal to half the speed of light. MB. Thus, the diameter is changing at the speed of light. And later it said, In the framework of the theory we have developed, it is a remarkable coincidence that the magnitude of r dot, that is, the change of the diameter of the universe, is so close to the velocity of light. Nowhere has light entered into our considerations. MB note. There is a unity in the design of the universe. We note that all three determinations seem to agree remarkably well in order of magnitude with the most modern observations of cosmology. We think that the evidence this provides in support of Mach's principle is impressive. MB. In other words, it ties up with real observations, not theoretical ideas that are contradictory or cannot be confirmed. Relativity, black holes, missing mass, etc. The planetary dynamics provides a natural explanation for what are otherwise mysterious and inexplicable cosmic coincidences between the parameters of the universe and the elements of the planets. MB. It shows that this universe has been put together like a well-planned creation, complete with coincidences that are unlikely to have happened by chance. That it is designed stares cosmologists in the face, even in this complex field of science. No discussion of Mach's principle is complete without reference to general relativity. Does general relativity satisfy Mach's principle, and if not, why not? Our belief is that it does not. He then discusses Newton's bucket experiment and that he was wrong to extend this effect as an effect for the whole cosmos. In the same way that Minkowski's space-time theory cannot be applied to the whole of space. He concludes by saying, The task facing Einstein was to create a relational theory. In fact, he did exactly the opposite. Following Newton's example, he assumed the local laws of physics proved the existence of space-time, which he endowed with an absolute character and intrinsic properties. But the intrinsic properties were the very ones that had to be explained. We think he put the cart before the horse. And then later, by putting them as fundamental constants into his local physics, Einstein may have unwittingly, question mark, smuggled into general relativity integrated properties of the universe 
which then, of course, show up in planetary dynamics. MB note. This claim that in his theory he had assumed the very principles he said his theory proved has been made by other critics of relativity. He certainly did not smuggle them in unwittingly. It was all part of the deceit to change the direction of science and allow the mathematicians to exert a controlling influence over it. The end result of the acceptance of relativity into mainstream science is its corruption. I spend several pages in my book, True Science Agrees with the Bible, showing how cosmologists are now mainly mathematicians. Where before mathematics was used to examine and explain certain results that had been observed, the situation now is that the ruling mathematicians go to the observing astronomers and ask them to look for certain evidence to support their conclusions, i.e. Big Bang, Black Holes, Missing Mass, etc. Even the slimmest observed evidence is then interpreted to bolster the claims of the mathematicians. Finally, in summary. This paper presents a radically different model of the cosmos. It gives a very natural explanation of a number of unusual features of the universe and of our planetary system. However, of greater interest to many, it also explains how using Mach's principle fits the geocentric universe perfectly in this model. In order that this important paper should be available for study for all who are interested in these subjects, I tried to find a website that had this paper available on it, that I could refer readers to so that they could check my statements. I could not find one easily, so I googled Barbour, and on the following reference he gave a list of his 23 papers which included his 1977 paper. All these papers could be downloaded for study except his 1977 paper and one other. Why cannot the public download this important paper? It cannot be that it has been superseded because an earlier 1974 paper could be downloaded. It seems suspiciously like a blockage to prevent this important paper being widely disseminated in view of the way in which it contradicts much that present cosmologists hold to. But more importantly, its criticism of Einstein and its convincing conclusions that they have no use for relativity. I have scanned in the copy given in Gerardus Bauer's book Geocentricity Papers. It can be read at www.mbowden.info forward slash barbour.htm This is the first of 15 pages. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you for listening.